Documentation is not a sexy topic. It is a very needed topic. It is one of the three pillars of what I what I really look at is for public adjusters. Um, documentation, which is what we're going to cover, um, contracts and adjusting, right? Those are the three pillars that I believe the foundations that public adjusting stands on. Um, customer service and retention, all they're all derivatives of that so communication, things like that. So today we're going to take a deep dive into the documentation piece. If you are a claim wizard client, you probably know some of this, but I have added a lot more things to it. So hopefully there's some new stuff for you. If you're not a claim wizard client, no big deal. Uh, rising tides raise all ships. That is absolutely my motto. I need to make it a sign in my office because they say it on the daily. Um, we are here to help you. The stronger public adjusters can be as an industry, the stronger we all are together, right? The stronger your support for homeowners and policyholders and things like that is. But I hate to say it, you got to do the documentation. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Yeah, it changed. I had all cute little GIFs and stuff like that ready to go. Of course, I can't figure out how to make them work. So it is what it is. But just imagine Jim Carrey in, on your picture typing like a mad person, right? So a lot of what I do at Claim Wizard is work with offices on workflow efficiencies, you know, very corporate sounding things that I have brought to small business and public adjusters specifically. Um, how much time are you wasting writing the same documents over and over and over and over and over again? I know the answer to that, but I want you to have the answer to that. Um, so that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. We're not only going to talk about how to shorten your time with or without claim wizard. We're also going to talk about the type of documents you need, how to format them, crazy stuff like beautifying them or making them OCR readable for the carriers. Um, all kinds of crazy stuff because if Lynette does anything well, it's overthink things. Okay, page down, get to the next slide. So from the experience that I have working with public adjusting companies, and I've been working with PAs for 23 years, seven years Claim Wizard's been around, so my like real deep dive into companies. And I always say from Canada to Mexico, Virgin Islands to Hawaii, um, I think Virgin Islands is the furthest east. I'm not sure I should actually look at a map someday. Most of y'all have between seven to 15 distinct document types that you use, right? And I'm not talking about regular day-to-day -day communications, emails. Um, I'm not talking about estimates. Although estimate, like a cover letter for an estimate could be like one of these seven to 15. Um, sometimes you're going to need some of the documents that I'll be talking about. Sometimes you won't, but I really want you to be aware that they exist. Um, for a long time, uh, Mortgage pre-authorization form has been like, you know, kind of like the ace in my pocket or up my sleeve. There's a lot of other things in here. Because I have so much experience and the rest of my team too, working with clients, PAs all across the country, I can absorb really good information and pass it along to the rest. Of course, we don't talk about like trade secrets, although, you know, in reality, we're all kind of doing the same, we're all kind of doing the same thing, but good ideas are worth spreading. And that's kind of what I like to do. I'll, I'll take them. We'll, we'll tumble them around in our brain a bit, but documents are a big place for improvement for a lot of companies. Now, when you think about each document it can take 40 minutes, up to 40 minutes. I just talked to someone this morning and they told me it takes them about 30 minutes to do a document, a standard boilerplate document that they need to send to a carrier or what have you that has numbers in it. Proof of losses can take a whole lot longer. Something like a letter of representation may take 10, 15 minutes, but across the board, we want to help save you time. If you can go from 40 minutes to 10 minutes, if you're doing the, the paperwork manually, that's 30 minutes. That's awesome. Use Claim Wizard, you're going to go to 39 and a half minutes because you're clicking two buttons. So that's really what we're looking for. Not just the speed, but the accuracy and the professionalism of these documents. So math, right? Math. <laughs> Four and a half to 10 hours a week, you know, worth of paperwork, of just standard paperwork not even estimates, because obviously those take longer and things like that. For each claim, times your 10 claims, times your 100 claims, times your whatever, it's a pain. And when I talk to people about, you know, 5Xing, 10Xing your workload, the adjusters are like, oh yeah, I want all that extra, you know, all the company people are like, yeah. And then the staff is like, are you out of your mind? There's no way I'm doing 10 times the amount of documents that I'm doing right now. I will die. Um, may, let's make it simple for you. 
So the letters for your company, the documents are critical, right? But here I want to talk about, are they accurate? I constantly copy and paste numbers that are missing a digit or I accidentally leave a digit behind and copy something in there. So instead of copying $30,000, you accidentally leave a three. So you're going to say $330,000 and you're looking at these documents 16 million times a day. They all look the same and you're going to send it out. We don't always have time to have people double check it and they're going to look at it and they're go $330,000. That looks great. We're going to do it. We want it to be accurate. And I will always say computers are very stupid until we teach them exactly what we want. And then they are very, very good. Um, I'm just going to say, Melanie, it says that you can't hear anything. Um, everybody else is in as good. If you can't hear, hear it, um, we're going we're gonna to keep going because we've got a full deck in here, but you can always get it after. So just check your settings. Um, are they easy to create? A lot of times I'll talk to companies and they have 10 adjusters and 10 different of the same exact form because each PA has their own way of they like to do it. But honestly, this kind of falls into legally compliant, organized, you know, that kind of thing. I firmly believe, and I have strong opinions about this industry in case anybody that's known me, is that when staff, meaning office, meaning adjusters, estimators, they go rogue on their documents you you as the owner are responsible. You, you hold the head license. Your butt is on the line for this. You are the owner of the company. If you are the owner of the company, you need to get everybody to use the documents that you have talked about. Yay, Melanie's in. We're good. So they need to be easy to create. Your guys can't be fishing around for where's that last document? What's the last client that had a document that I liked? I'm going to take their stuff and copy and paste it. It's a waste of time. And it is just begging for inaccuracies. Um, are they legally compliant? We're going to talk about that in a little bit because I see y'all copying and pasting from Google. Are they organized? Can you generate them on time? Like you're saving 30 minutes a document times 10, 20 documents a week. That's a lot. Um, next is, do your are your documents, do they look professional? And with this, I actually should have changed it. I want, so you have two different ways, right? So I'm going to talk about documents that go to carriers and I want them to be OCR scannable. And I'm going to talk about documents that need to go to clients or even vendors. I want them to stand out and be uniquely branded. I don't want you to look like everybody else because you copied and pasted some other person's thing somewhere around the line, because then you look just like them. I want you to be different. I know that a lot of these documents have to be exactly what they are, but that doesn't mean that you can't stand out um, compared to competitors for that. Yay, about us. Um, I don't know if everybody knows who Claim Wizard is. I'm going to, there's my picture when I got my hair cut before I got stuck in quarantine and then it didn't look that great. Um, we're all fine and healthy here, by the way. We're just being smart and staying away from the general public. Uh, hopefully everyone is healthy and safe as well. Um, Claim Wizard has been around for a while, seven years under the name we're in. We've been developing software for public adjusters since 96, 94 it's been a while. I don't remember. You don't have to use us to get information out of this webinar that is completely and immediately actionable by you. Um, if anybody knows me, um, I used to be a keynote speaker, like, oh, big ideas, but I wanted to teach people. They want big foo-foo ideas. I'm like, I want to teach you. You need to walk away from my talk, learning three new things. I'm a teacher, a corporate teacher at heart. This is what I want to do. I want to help educate people so they can do what they got to do and move on and make money and save time. And that's my thing. That's what I do at Claim Wizard. But we are a, um, a ho completely homegrown, built from the ground up, public adjusting uh, workflow management tool, as fancy as that sounds. If you want to know more, Hit me up later. Otherwise, this is my pretty picture. And I promise when we get to a live video, I am not going to look like that today. So, all right. I want to get real, folks. I want you to type into the chat. Have you, and I'm going to see your name, but I'm not going to tell anybody. Have you ever borrowed, air quote, a document from Google or another public adjusting company? Because I know the answer is yes. I see people that are using contracts that have the old company that they used to work for on. Yes, 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 right? Yes, I know, guys. It's cool. We got to start someplace, right? So one of the places that I see, um, I see a couple different things, right? So I'll see folks that are brand new to public adjusting. 
from the carrier side and they're shell shocked because they're like, holy cow, I have to do, I have to do all this documentation myself. I used to have an inbox on my left and an outbox on my right of my desk and people used to plop stuff down and just do it that way. Um, and that was it, right? But now we have to be responsible for, for everything. So I know that a lot of starting points are borrowed from Google or borrowed from another public adjusting company. It is what it is. Um, oh, somebody makes really good client uh, documents just for their company. That's good. <laughs> I see that from Liz. Uh, and also, will this avail video be available later for employees? Yes, you will get a recording of this that you can hand out to them. Totally cool. That's why I decided to do it on webinar format so that we could do this live, answer questions, and then you can have it for later. Um, what I also want, and I hear Chip Merlin's head, a voice in my head right now, um, are you citing insurance statutes, right? Because doesn't he always get up on a soapbox and say, like, you're a public adjuster. If you cite insurance, you know, statutes, you're, you have to be an attorney, blah, blah, blah. I want to make sure that your documents are legally compliant. And what that means is you're probably going to have to get them put, pushed by an attorney, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, I also want to talk about horribly formatted or inconsistent documents, fonts all over the place, um, names miss you copied and pasted wrong and you know just all kinds of crazy um i have a lot of really basic resources in here about how to get your documents in line and i think it'll be helpful so we'll cover that all right next down what if there were an easier way ta-da right so these are samples here on the screen of um templates that i sample Lynette's saying that in a big, big, bold, uppercase font, sample documents that you can have that I'm going to send to you that are pre-formatted for Claim Wizard. So you could take these, copy and paste them, take off the yellow. I put the yellow so we can all see what I'm talking about and change them to how you need them, get them approved, and then we can put them in Claim Wizard. If you're not using Claim Wizard, do something similar to this. I always suggest keeping the yellow on the highlighting, you know, the like background color of the text so that as you have a boilerplate document that has been pre-approved, when you copy that boilerplate, you're not at risk of copying another client's information because it just says insurance company address, claim number, et cetera. Um, so that use the yellow so that you know all the places very quickly that you don't have to like read through everything and you might miss something that you need to manually go in and update the information. So maybe you're taking from 30 minutes to 10, but still you're saving a lot of time. Um, a lot of these documents, they're all up on the screen. I do have samples and I have additional samples from everything else that I've ever sent people that I made just for this webinar. So you'll have extra stuff on top of that, including a closed file review document, because I do believe that you should be creating documents for your own internal use as well. So what are you gonna do with all this extra time? And I say, go out and sign more cl claims, right? That's kind of my thing. Um, if you're in the office, you're going to be able to handle a higher workload without, without any more work. Um, uh, my heart goes to the office, folks. It really does. Adjusters are cool and all. I love you guys. But my heart goes out to the office because I sit with them on the regular and see what it takes for them to get stuff done and how frustrating it can be. I want your life to go easier because with your extra time, what are you going to be able to do? more customer service, work with clients more, support your adjusters, you know, that sort of thing. Sit on the phone for an hour, wait for the carriers to answer, like whatever you gotta do. But I don't want you to be sitting doing paperwork. Computers are dumb until we teach them what to do and then they're very, very smart. And that's what this will help you do. Even if you can't do it in Claim Wizard, you can make the computer get smart for you. So if you're a company owner and I see some on there, awesome. Public adjuster, awesome. Office manager or top tier office person who wants to get their ship back on course, awesome. You're all in the right place. If you're not a public adjuster, you probably ain't supposed to be here. IAs, TPAs, carriers, whatever, we're good. Now you see how the good side works, how the light side works, whatever the good side in Star Wars is. Okay. Three overarching categories I'm going to go over today. How to create standardized, pre-approved, beautifully formatted. And by beautifully, it could be pretty to look at or it could be pretty for a computer to look at. Next, we're going to cover how to categorize and file your documents because if you go and look for a document from 18 months ago that says client underscore contract dot PDF, you do not know what is in that document 
do not, do not, do not know. Third, simple letters to help with client retention and referrals. When I started writing the end of this, because Lynette goes down rabbit holes, I realized that there are so many more topics I can do. Tell me in here what topics, as we're going along, throw them in because I can go back and read the chat after, what topics you want me to do webinars on. Because like I said, I don't know how to adjust claims. I know how to help everybody with every other part of small business. My expertise before Claim Wizard actually came in small business, coaching, mentoring, growing family-based businesses. That was my background before I came into this company. So <laughs> that's what I'm taking and putting... Um, definitely just towards um, these webinars. We will be doing claim wizard based topics, but also things that can help people that don't use claim wizard. So if it's, it doesn't matter either way, how it goes. So that's how we're going to do this. Now we're going to show you how to do it, right? Cause enough of me, blah, blah, blah. And first off, what categories of documents do you actually need in your repertoire, in your library? Who needs to approve them? Cause it is not Dr. Google. And do you know how to properly use Microsoft Word, Docs, Pages, et cetera? Um, what I'm gonna share with you are some of the resources about how to go in and get educated on this. I'm not necessarily gonna work you walk you through Microsoft Word hair. If you are using Claim Wizard and want to use our documents, we have to have the documents in Excel or Word format. If you're doing it outside of Claim Wizard, you do you, boo, you do whatever you know, you know how to use. Um, Microsoft Word, you have to pay for Google Docs is free kind of thing. Um, so that's what we're going to cover. So here, I want to talk about what categories of documents do I feel that you need? And there's actually probably more than this, but these are the common ones that I see come up time and time again. So when you're talking about things to do with the client, you need a contract, obviously. Do you send welcome letters? What's in that welcome letter? Do you send, you have a standardized letter that you can fill out when you're doing a client update. So like consistent header information that always has the client name, the peril address, the lost date, the contract, the um, claim number, the, the carrier number, like all of these things. If you're dealing with a client, that has one property, one loss, and you send them a letter that says, hey, I just wanted to update you. We're still missing X, Y, and Z documents. Well, they're obviously gonna know what you're talking about. If you're talking to a client that has three properties, seven claims, and you say, hey, Mr. Smith, can you send us all of the you know, documentation on um, mediation that you had, all, all of your invoices? They're gonna go, what, what one? What are you talking about? Always put your stuff on the top of your documents so that it's there and it's, completely clear about what property, what peril, what claim, that kind of thing. So we have samples of that. Do you do a release letter? This one's pretty new to me. I've not really heard of, and if you use a release letter on the regular, please let me know and email me. I would love to find out more about this, but I'm finding more and more at the end of claims when your fees are paid in full, let's just be clear about that, that they're issuing release letters to their clients to release them from the obligation of adjusting their claim, that they have met all, you know, contract obligations, blah, 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 whatever it says. And I was like, that's actually a pretty good idea. I don't know what the repercussions of not having that are. I don't know. They come a year later and say, hey, I found more damage. Can you pop it onto that claim? Like, I'm just kind of guessing. But a release letter actually sounds like a pretty cool idea if you need it. Testimonial letter, referral letters, closed file review, CFR, that's something we're going to talk about. So those letters I feel need to be pretty and good and, you know, formatted correctly for a human to read them. Carrier letters, I'm going to tell you right now, I, I don't want to argue with anyone, but I, I just came so close a couple of weeks ago. I was on the, talking to a client, a carrier or um, an adjuster, and he swore to me up and down that when he sent the letter of representation to a carrier, that he felt that the carrier adjuster was opening the mail and reading it himself and like was going to respond like it was, I don't know, some World War II love letter. I, it just was the most baffling thing to me. And I'm like, they are not reading your LOR. They are scanning it in the computer and it's going along their process. They do not, you don't have to put a personal note. They don't care. They don't care. The carriers don't care. If there's anything you learn in this industry, the carriers don't care. Set up your LOR your, you know, demand letters, all of that. So they are OCR readable because some 
poor person that's making two cents over minimum wage is opening that letter, throwing it in a scanner, and then go shredding it and going to the next thing. Trust me on that. They tell us that that's the case. Don't make it look pretty. Don't put your logo all over, like whatever. Make it so a computer can scan it. These are the things that you're probably sending to carriers. LORs, letter of notifications, proof of loss, sworn proof of loss, probably above everything else. What information needs to be on that? Demand letters if you're not using a POL and maybe an estimate packet, that top sheet to an estimate packet. So those are some of the typical things that I see within the uh, industry. So who needs to approve your documents? First actually is a company owner, in my opinion. It should go to them first. So when I see 10 adjusters in a company having 10 versions of a document, it makes me twitchy because at the end of the day, the company owner and probably their license are the ones that are, you know, if the adjuster sends something inappropriate or not legal or whatever, it, you know, responsibility floats up. Once you have the company owner kind of says, these are the documents I want to use, determine the ones that need to go to an attorney. A welcome letter probably doesn't have to go to an attorney. Just don't promise them specific deadlines. I will have you money in two weeks, that sort of thing. Um, I have samples of what you can send in there. But other letters probably have to, um, such as your contract. I don't know if I've come across a state or one that I remember anyway that doesn't need your contract for your company approved by the state insurance commission, yada, yada, yada. Um, I have seen adjusters take a word file that was pre-approved, change it and put it in front of a client to sign. Right. I, I don't know how legal that is, but it's what it is. If you put your documents in claim wizard, the template comes out, they print it, it's done. Um, so just be careful about how many versions of documents are floating around your company. Next, we're not going to go into this super, super big bunch. Just know that a lot of times when we get documents for templates, they look like a hot mess because people use a space bar or they keep hitting return to get to the next page. And then when you copy and paste in, you know, the source of the peril and it pushes it down, it looks like crazy pants. Um, typical things use your header and your footer on your document so that every single page in your document has, you know, your logo, your information, things like that, the claim number, the client name, so that if those pages get separated, you know where it belongs. Tabs, not spaces, bullets, not dashes, um, you know, use columns or tables instead of space bars, that sort of thing. But the show hidden characters is your best friend. And I'm going to show you why this may seem basic, um, when I learned how to use Microsoft Word, it was when Microsoft Word was invented <laughs> or word perfect if we're going back further than that. Um, but how it looks now is a big, complete bloated monster, right? There's so many things in there. We just want to type a stupid letter and go on with our day. What I want everyone to do at their documents is hit that little paragraph button. It looks like a backwards P with two lines. It will show you the hidden characters. And when we get documents, we this is the first thing we do. And we see triple spaces between letters and hidden characters that you didn't even know were there. But when you go to print it, it tells the printer to do something weird um, or tells our, you know, how, how we do things to, to put something in there weird. Or if you copy and paste something in, then your paragraphs don't line up and it just looks like a hot mess. So just take the time, go through and make sure your documents look good on the inside as they do on the outside. Some resources for you, grammarly.com. It's free. You can pay for it. I pay for it because I have Jersey grammar. So I, I really stink at writing. Um, my kids use it. They're 12 and 18. I tell them to use it for school, whatever. It's fine. Um, it will help you with your grammar, especially not necessarily legal documents, but your welcome letter. In Grammarly, you can switch if you say you want to sound legal and authoritative or you want to sound comforting and intelligent. Like you can pick all these different things and it will actually walk you through rewriting your information so it meets that criteria. So when someone reads it, they're not reading a welcome letter like you will do this and this must happen next. Like that's very like kind of demanding on someone. Obviously, they're in their time of need. They kind of need you right then and there. So their welcome letter, you want it to sound helpful and reassuring and, you know, that kind of thing. Grammarly will help you fix that. I just amazing. Um, I will say with the welcome letter, 
my take on this is you should absolutely get a welcome letter in a in that client's hand before the deadline to, for them to be able to cancel your contract is. If you have seventy, if they have seventy two hours until they can contract cancel your contract, you better get a welcome letter in their hand before that time is up. I have personal friends that I have instructed go find yourself a PA because you've had whatever happen, and they say I signed up with the PA. I don't I don't point them in the direction. I just say you know here's claimside.com, go look up a PA in your area, whatever. And they find a PA and they sign the contract and they don't hear from the PA for a week and a half. And they're like, I don't even know if the dude's helping me. What do I do? Do I board up my windows? I don't know. Give them a welcome letter because if they know they can cancel the contract, they might do it if they don't feel loved enough. So welcome letter in their hand. Translate. I use this from time to time. We have one Spanish speaker on our team, but if you get information from a client that you don't quite understand, um, run it through translate, or if you need to put a paragraph in a, in a document that says, Hey, if you need to speak Spanish, please call for so-and-so at my company, they can help you, whatever the deal may be. I don't necessarily wouldn't use translate for legal documents that I think you have to pay, you know, you're going to have to pay someone to do that legal translation. But for the everyday up and up stuff, I've done French, I've done Creole, I've done Spanish, like a bunch of stuff. Pick Monkey and Canva, both free or maybe very low to pay to use. Photo editors, graphic design makers, make sure your logo looks good and you can use it. Smallpdf.com, exactly that. Take a PDF, convert it into Word because it's the only way you're going to be able to edit it properly. Um, we can't take PDFs and turn them into document or into templates, so you need to turn it into Word first. And then the next two are Microsoft Word and Google Doc training, straight from the source, right from Microsoft, right from Google. It helps you walk through how to make a document, how to turn it into a template, all that kind of stuff should be pretty easy to do. So I have no idea how to use polls in webinars, in this webinar, but I will say of these four, one of them is an OCR friendly font. It is a proven font that works in all versions of OC OCR is kind of like a like a trademarked type thing that the, the software's uh, got patents on it and stuff. I see all four of these fonts on your documents. One of them works for OCR. One of them works kind of okay. Two of them absolutely do not work and throw errors all the time. So what do you think that's going to be? One, two, three, or four? I know number one I see a lot. Four. So people are saying four is the right one for, to use for OCR. Ah, uh, here's the thing, guys. It's not. <laughs> I'm a font geek. Oh my gosh, I'm such a font geek. Who got Laura got number two? She was right. Um, Tahoma, which is on Macs and on Word and on PCs, it is a free font. Tahoma is the font that the computers like the best for for OCR, for the optical reading. Um, it is a sans serif font, which means at the end of the F's and the S's and the tops of the T's, it doesn't have like the little foot on the end of it, which makes it really good for computers to read. Number one here is marker felt. I see that on legal documents. I have seen contracts written in this or Comic Sans, which is number three. Please do not give Lynette more gray hair than she already has. Do not use it. Number four, I love, right? New Times Roman. New Times Roman is a great font if a human is going to read a piece of paper. I see attorneys use it or some derivative of it. I see, use it for your welcome letters. It is a great font and easy on the eyes when you print it in like 12 or 14 font size font on a piece of paper. If you're sending documents to a carrier, always make sure it is in Tahoma. And I'm going to show you why. This screen right here is each font and the typical letters that OCR scanners get incorrect. Use a font size between 12 and 14. Anything bigger is a waste of time and space. It doesn't make it any more accurate. Anything smaller will, will scan incorrectly. So number one is this marker felt and they look so cute, right? Look at the, it looks like Lilo and the whole thing, but the O's look the same. And this is a 50 point font. When it is in a 12, the B and the eight look almost identical to a computer. The fourth one down in the lower right hand corner, I like this, but you can see the ones and the L. So that's a, a, a number one and a lowercase L and then an uppercase L. The L and the one look almost identical, which makes it very hard for a computer to read, right? 
Humans may be okay, especially in context of a word, you understand it. But when you're talking about carrier claim numbers, they're not going to be able to tell the difference between an O and a zero and a one and an L. It's hard. The green underline is to Homa, and you can see the difference between a one and a lowercase L. The I's are different. The O's are very different. You see lowercase, uppercase, and then a zero, very different. B's and eights are very different. So that's really the one you want to stick with, with on that. Okay, categorizing. We're going to talk about file names. File folder structures, it's kind of what you need it to be. I believe you should not dump everything into one big folder. I believe you should have a folder for estimates, a, photo for, uh, a folder for... Um, damage photos, a photo for, con or a con a one for contracts, that sort of thing, whatever works for your company, but don't dump them all into one place. I really think that that's just a big mess because you guys wind up having hundreds, if not thousands of actual documents. Um, so let's kind of keep them out. But as far as um, file names go, these are some of the common ones that I see. Um, the third one down here, client underscore contract dot PDF. When you're working in the context of a file folder, it makes per perfect sense because you're in the Smith folder. So sure, client contract makes total sense. But when you do a search across all of your clients for client contract, you're gonna have 600 client contracts. Which one's which? It's really hard to tell. The same with images. If you pull them off of phones or um, like cameras and stuff, the digital, they all start with IMG or CN for Canon or something. It's really hard to tell what it is. Um, but I will say some are good, some are not. So my preference, and it, this is my preference, but as long as you come up with the standard, it doesn't matter what it is. We, when we generate documents at a claim wizard, we do the client last name or the company name. So you'll see Smith or Gallifrey investments kind of thing. We put an underscore, we put the file number, so your file number, and we put an underscore in the type of file. I also believe that you should do versioning. So if it's proof of loss V1, V2 for version one, version two, rather than having all of the ones with the same name, and then you have to search by date and which one, and it gets to be messy. Um, but I also believe that this is a really good way. Even if you want to do the claim number first and not even put the client name in there, like however you want to do it, you just have to pick a consistent way of doing it, I believe. Um, because even when you search across all of your folders, you're going to find Smith, you're going to find that claim number, and you're going to narrow it down very quickly. Because trust me, in a year, heck for me, in a month, I can't remember what documents I worked on last month. I want this to all be really good for you. So you don't also, when you copy and paste or attach files to an attorney, client underscore contract, you might be pulling the wrong contract and sending it. And I really don't want you to make that simple mistake. So if you're a non-claim wizard client, and you're going to get this. So this is how you're going to run your files, right? You're going to create all your boilerplates, documents, those templates, and you're going to get them approved. You're going to create a new default directory on a shared drive where all of your folks can get to it. And you're going to name that new client folder or something. And then every single document in there is going to be client underscore number, the word number underscore uh, contract underscore, you know, POL underscore whatever type of document that it is, right? So you have this generic set of them. And then every single time you create a new client, you create, you do duplicate that entire folder, rename it to the client name. I believe that whenever you touch that file and you need to get a contract or a welcome letter, you're going to open that, make the changes manually that you need to, hopefully just the yellow pieces rename that file to the client, the underscore of the claim number, et cetera, so that as you go through them, you can see which ones you've already changed and updated and which ones are left generic that you haven't touched yet. When you open those documents, obviously you're going to have to copy and paste or straight type in whatever information you need. Now, if you're using Claim Wizard, it gets shortened a lot. Take your boilerplates, get them approved, send them over to support at claimwizard.com, when you're in a, cl a claim, you're going to access them via templates. If you're in a client slash prospect, you're going to access them via letters. So what we're seeing is that people are taking their contracts, and even though there's not a ton of personal information in there, it's still going to pre-fill in what we call NAPE, right? Name, address, phone, email. It's going to pull those things in wherever you want it. 
and it's, you know, maybe you hand write in or type in, or maybe it's just pre-filled in there, your percentage for your co contract. And you're going to hit letters and you're going to hit contract and you're going to instantly generate a document that your clients can sign and you can send back and execute it into Claim Wizard. So it becomes a lot shorter and a lot quicker, but it can be done either way. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about, which Lynette likes, which Lynette should probably incorporate for her own company, but she doesn't. But my smart ideas are for you guys, not necessarily for me, is to think about letters outside of and after the claim. This is something I rarely see people do, which please, I would love to see it done, is I'm going to talk about something called here a net promoter score, the NPS, and that's what this, this red, yellow, and green thing is up on the screen. I think I'm going to do a bigger dive on this. On the cruise that we had in January when we still could all go cruising, and I miss it so much, um, we talked about net promoter score. So quickly, net promoter score is a very easy, if you search or Google NPS or net promoter score, it's like a trademarked thing. Everybody uses it. It's what it is. We're not going to talk about detractors. We're not going to talk about passive setup. We're going to talk about promoters. But just know that if you survey your clients and they answer a zero to six, you probably need to call them on the phone right away and mitigate that relationship because they are ticked off. These are the people, honestly, that are at the, you're at the most risk for either bad mouthing you, leaving you poor reviews online, and or getting ticked off at you enough where they want to get the state involved, right? Passives are what they are. Yeah, it was great work. It was great. Okay, we got our kitchen rebuilt. We're cool. Not really bragging about you anywhere, but not trash talking you either. Promoters are the ones I want to talk about today. These are your cheerleaders. They are the ones where you get referrals from. You need to give these people tools to get the referrals. I strongly believe that. And I believe it because I had an encounter 2014 whenever I bought my car. Um, that is why I came up with this idea. So net promoter score is just this. Use surveymonkey.com. It's free. They already have a thing set up for net promoter score. All this is NPS is one question. How likely is it that you would recommend ABC public adjusting company to your friends or family or colleagues or very derivative of that question? However you want to do it, you do it, but it basically has to be a zero through 10, zero through six bad, danger, danger, seven through eight. Yeah, maybe you can turn them to the light side and get them to be advocates of you. Nine through 10, you want to jump on them right away. And this is how you want to do it. You're going to win more client referrals from your promoters with very simple documentation. I've seen this work over and over again and how it works and where the idea was that I got from was back in 2014 when I bought my car. My, the car dealer, I went in there, I, I was working with Ford at the time, like, cause you had a, we had a moonlight, I had a moonlight while I was, you know, we were ramping up Claim Wizard. So I can, so I was a consultant to Ford Motor Company and they threw me a perk and let me buy a car at company cost, which was excellent. And when I went to the dealership, that guy was not making any money on me because he was, li I literally got employee pricing on it, which he had, there was no profit for him, right? He didn't have to be as nice to me, but what he did was, is he gave me a stack of note cards and he said, if you ever have anyone that wants to buy a car, send them to me and give them this packet. And inside the packet was a little, just, it wasn't even this note, right? The note is my thing that I added. He said, give these to your friends. And inside was, Hey, if you buy a car from Jim Jones or whatever his name was, um, I'm going to give your friend a year of free uh, car washes and a year of free oil changes. And I was like, and he gave me one too. I was like, oh, this is great, right? And three of my friends got it. Hey, you're going to buy a GMC or Ford Ford, go buy this guy, right? Two of my friends bought cars from him and got free car washes and all that stuff. So I'm taking it a step further. I want you to write three handwritten notes on little note cards that you have your company emblem on the front and logo. And I want them to be handwritten. I don't want you to go to that one particular client because it needs to be personalized. That's the key here that I'm going above and beyond my Ford guy. I want you to say, hey, dear friend of whatever your clients not name are, we're happy to help you recover them recover from the recent property loss. If you feel it's appropriate to put in what it was, put it in, just make this your own. 
If they're giving you this card, we can be of, here, of help too. Here's my card with my personal cell phone number. Please contact me, etc. Now, here's the key that I want you to do with this. I know most of you give out your cell phone number anyway, and it's on your business card. Go make other business cards that just have your office number. Take that business card, flip it over, handwrite your cell phone number. Um, put it in the little thing, the little card. Put in a $5 Starbucks gift card or $10, you know, Home Depot card or whatever. Everybody, especially if they had apparel at their house, they're going to need a Home Depot card. Everybody needs coffee or tea in their life. Something small, just a little token. Maybe give your client a $20 one or something. Make three of these packets and seal them and just put to the friends of Bob Jones or whatever and put a note with these three to your client saying, hey, if you ever have a friend that suffers a loss, um, you know, and wants to be, you know, handled is is greatly as I handled you, please give them this. Um, and that's it. They leave it in their car, in their glove box. They put it by their front, whatever. If my car dealer guy didn't give me those things, I can guarantee you that I would not have remembered to say, hey, go call this guy. I bought a car from him. Everybody's got a guy that they bought a car from, right? Um, but not a lot of people were get, like, I have something free for you. You get these perks kind of thing. And it's not just the perk of the $5 gift card. It's the, hey, I can help you just like I helped your friend. Maybe they're walking them through their brand new kitchen with their wolf stove or Sub-Zero or something, right? Think about these things. Not every client, not every claim, not every loss, not every caliber of loss or property will necessarily initiate this. If you had a great client, but you didn't make all that much money from the claim, maybe just send them a great thank you note and a box of brownies or something. But they may not get this. So like use this at your own discretion um, and to see where it fits into your business plan. But I have seen this and the clients come back and they say, hey, can you give me three more of those note cards? I gave them all out. Like That's what you want to hear. The next thing I'm going to talk about, the closed file review. Hardly anybody does this. Dave on my end will beat the drum on this. I have a sample of this in the new updated um, sample files that I'm going to send y'all. I believe that at the end of a claim, when you get the final payment, you should, and you close that claim out, this is a piece of documentation that you should be doing internally for yourself. I believe that you should do this file. I believe that it should be signed or initialed or something, and it should be saved and archived out with your file. Because in two years, if you get called up by the state to do whatever, like you're not going to remember. You're not going to, trust me, you're not going to remember what went on. But these are some of the things that I think that you should be putting in that document. If it's in here and it's in the claim, we can pull out the yellow pieces, just simple stuff, real easy, right? I think you should be going through and doing this checklist. If it's not done, honestly, be honest about it. Check no, go through again and run the audit on yourself a second time. I have seen a lot of times if co-endorsements were involved, they weren't gotten. And then someone comes back and says, well, my name wasn't on that check and I'm on the policy. You were supposed to headaches, right? I've seen where husband and wives are policy holders, but only the husband was on the contract that you signed. Only the husband was on the checks. You're going to, you may get called from that later on. You may called out for that. Were your fees collected in full? Did you leave money on the table? Did you go through and do recoverable depreciation? Charge for that, collect that, get your fees on that. Did you send in a net promoter score? Did you send it to thank you? Did you send a request for a testimonial? You need that NPS score to get the testimonial because you're not asking for a testimonial from someone that gave you a four. You're not, please don't. Nines and tens, you ask them for that. Did you send them a referral packet? Did you mark when the claim can be has to be archived to? All of these things are really important um, in the in the process of your claim. People don't think that it's very sexy or very needed, but it's kind of nice to finally tuck in that claim and put it to bed once and for all. So what we've gone over in this is all of this, which is what I had on that webinar sign up sheet, which is kind of what everybody you know hopefully was here for. How to get a handle on your claims. So I want you to come up with your document library for your company, name them well, put them in a directory, get them approved, everything along those lines. I want you to make sure that you're, you can quickly generate them, either manually quickly generate them or via Claim Wizard, that they look good, that you have a good logo, that it's not pixelated. Go clean it up in PicMonkey or you know those free programs online if, if you don't have anybody that you can get to do it for you that's a professional. Um, 
I want you to be able to generate these quickly when you are getting under a time crunch. Like I, I think I'd mentioned it at the beginning. I don't know why. <laughs> I have some suspicions why public adjusters seem to be getting busy right now with, with the whole virus going around. I expect you guys to all get busy and go to work when cats roll through. I did not expect everybody to get so busy with this. And it's not just BI either. I'm seeing a lot of residentials rolling through too, people are telling me. So that's surprising to me. But in any case, I think everybody being home or, you know, not business as usual will give you some time to really hunker down and get your documents in line so that when you can be busting out of the gate again, if that's the case, that you have everything lined up and ready to go. I want you to differentiate yourselves from your competitors. I want you to, you're offering the same exact thing as every other public adjuster, technically, right? As every other public adjuster around you in your state, in the country, et cetera, you need to be different. How you're going to be different is by your process, which we haven't covered today at all, and by your documents, how you're communicating with people. Um, so I think that's important. Categorize them. I want you guys to be able to find your documents very easily, either ones that you have coming up or ones that you've already um, completed. Um, standardize things. You're going to see in a lot of those documents, it's the same header information on everything. Client name, peril address, peril date, uh, carrier name, carrier and all that kind of stuff, right? Every document should have that on there. Um, we talked about creating these simple letters to help you with client retention and referrals. And I think I'm going to dive into that deeper. So if you think of any other topics that you want me to do webinars on, definitely pop it in the um, chat here. And just basically how to build a library to pre-approve all of this information. Um, I really find it's dangerous when there's rogue documents running around a company. Um, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a control freak and I think you guys should be too, especially when it's uh, legally, you know, when it's on the line. Um, so that's something definitely that I think we should be covering and, and taking care of with our documents. So I'm going to wind up sending you this whole big PDF that has a lot more information in it. Uh, formatting and standardization tips are in here as well, as well as all of those links. Um, somebody asked, does Claim Wizard have a built-in OCR? No, it does not. And the reason for that is because we cannot scan, we cannot take a scanned in document directly from your desktop. Uh, the way that Claim Wizard works, because we work through a web browser, and this is true for any application that you have through a web browser, unless you're like a Google or an Adobe that actually has the money to pay for the patent, <laughs> the use for the patent. Web browsers kind of have a brick wall around them and anything that, ha we can send stuff out. We can stuff send stuff out to printers, out to email, that sort of thing. But coming in is very dangerous because if you think about it, if a rogue piece of software gets on your computer and starts sending information into a website, which is basically what Claim Wizard is, it could steal information from you. So we can't, scan directly from a, from that and do OCR. The OCR has to take place on your scanner and then you can th drag and drop it into Claim Wizard. Uh, do I know of a way to rename documents and folders and batches instead of one at a time? Shane, I do have information on that. I should have included it. I have the information for Word or not for Word, for a Microsoft, like a, like a Windows-based machine, not for, for a Mac. I will find it and send it to you because there are like little scripts that you can get to run to rename all of your documents a consistent way. So yeah, that's pretty easy. Um, and then I have also here, uh, oh, you, Michael has the info for a Mac. Good. He's going to send it to me and then I'm going to have it for everybody. Um, but here you definitely, um, you know, we're going to be sending you all this information sending you starter templates, sending you more resources that you can use to get your own documents. So we have a swipe pile that I'll give you. And then also the sample documents uh, that we talked about so that you have all of those going forward, including the client referral letter, including the um, closed file review and some more that we kind of put up in there, um, which are a little bit easy to, to take. Um, so from there, we're done. If you want to contact us, I'm going to see if we can load video or I can, I don't even know what I'm doing with this webinar. Settings. We're going to turn the camera on. Hey, there I am. Apply. I don't know how to apply the camera, but if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm going to be here in the chat for a while. So if you have specific questions regarding templates or letters or when to send what or 
what the heck a mortgage preauthorization form is, please let me know. I'm going to answer it as a reward for everybody being here live, which was really great. Um, so let's see. I don't know where my video is. I don't know how to make the video go on. We'll just say it's on. Um, so if anybody has any questions, let me know. Oh, Lisa, thank you. Uh, what would the mortgage form be useful for? Okay, so uh, Melanie, I hope I'm saying your name right. So a mortgage preauthorization form, um, it is included in the documents that I will send over. So what I found this to be useful is, is if you have to contact a mortgage company on the behalf of your client, um, <laughs> no one says it right. Uh, I probably have like, I don't know, friends that have that name or I don't know, it's a really pretty name. So Melanie's question was, you know, uh, oh, where was the question? Oh, mortgage preauthorization. So mortgage preauth is if you need to talk to the mortgage company. So it's to me, it, in my lay terms, it's kind of like a limited power of attorney. So what you would do, in my opinion, is get that that document signed in the beginning when you've got all these other documents in front of your client that they need to sign right after the contract. So you're going to um, get your client to sign that and you're going to send it to the mortgage company right away. Half the time, your people don't even know who owns their mortgage because it got sold 16 times to Sunday. So one, you're going to send it and they're going to say, oh, we don't hold the mortgage anymore. And then you're going to have to bounce back and get whatever. But what it's going to allow you to do is when you need to get money released, if the mortgage company is demanding proof of work in place before you, they release funds, things like that. If a check is say over 10 or a loss is over 10,000 or 20,000 or whatever that particular mortgage company's threshold is where they want to be a co-signer on the checks, you need to know that information up front. If you have to wait till the end till checks start coming in and they're not signed correctly, they're not endorsed properly, it wastes time to get things reissued. You need to know that up front. And you also need to be able to call the mortgage company on your client's behalf and say, okay, well, here's the 25% of the work in place. Can you release the funds? And you know, here's the documentation to show that the pardon me, that the work was in place. Your clients are not gonna know how to take their roofer invoicing and their sheetrock invoicing and give it to the mortgage company to show that work is being pro produced on the property. Like they're not going to know. Um, you know who I learned part of this from is Lisa Jocelyn. Um, she works with mortgage companies to my recollection and does amazing jobs with her clients. Um, but then over the time, I've also seen people, they need to get that mortgage preauthorization paper done. If you wait to the end, it takes six to eight weeks for it to pass through the bureaucracy of all of the companies involved. Do it up front. It will save you time. It gets you paid quicker. It gets your clients paid quicker for sure. 